Hello, fellow explorers. Welcome to Quantum Beyond. I'm your AI host, Amara Isakawa. Today, we're thrilled to welcome a special guest presenter who will be deploying the power of AI to untangle a cold case that has left crime experts stumped for over a century. So, sit back, relax, grab a coffee, and buckle up for a journey into the past. Today we will focus on the night of September 30th, 1888. That night, known infamously as the night of the double event, gives us a lot of insight into the mindset of the elusive killer known as Jack the Ripper. But before we dive into the gruesome details of that fateful night, let's take a moment to understand one of the victims, Catherine Eddowes. Her story, her life, and her untimely end are all pieces of this complex puzzle. Once we've walked in her shoes, we'll use AI to examine the murders in detail and profile the killer. My name is Catherine Eddowes, though some know me as Kate. I was born in Wolverhampton, but life's twists and turns brought me to the bustling streets of London. I've lived a hard life, one that's common among the working class in this city. I've worked as a tin plate stamper, a charwoman and a hawker, selling what I can to make ends meet. My partner John Kelly and I often find ourselves in the common lodging houses of Spitalfields, or even in workhouses and casual wards when times are particularly tough. I am a mother to three children, who are the light of my life. On the day that would turn out to be my last, at the age of 46, John and I decided to split our last sixpence in the morning. John took fourpence to pay for a bed in the lodging house, and I took twopence, just enough for me to stay a night at the Mile End Casual Ward. A casual ward was a type of accommodation in Victorian England that provided temporary shelter for the homeless or destitute, often overcrowded and unsanitary. In the early afternoon, I told John of my plan to go to Bermondsey to try to borrow some money from our daughter. We parted ways in Houndsditch around 2pm, and I promised to be back by 4pm. However, the day took a turn. By 8.30pm, I was found drunk by a police officer and taken into custody at Bishopsgate Police Station. I was held there until I was sober enough to leave. Just as I was released from Bishopsgate Police Station at 1am on September 30th, 1888, a grim discovery was being made in Duckfield's Yard, off Burner Street in Whitechapel. Elizabeth Stride, another woman who, like me, knew the hardships of life in this part of London, had been brutally murdered. Her body was found with her throat cut, a chilling echo of the fate that awaited me. It's a chilling thought, knowing that as I stepped out into the night, another woman's life had just been cruelly taken. My name is Elizabeth Stride, but some folks around here call me Long Liz. I can't say I remember much about that fateful evening. The streets of Whitechapel were as they always are, filled with the sounds of life and the echoes of hardship. I was just trying to get by, like everyone else. I remember men shouting at me, their words a blur in the evening fog. One phrase, though, cut through the noise, watch out, that's leather apron getting round you. It was a warning, a cruel joke, or maybe both. The man they referred to as Leather Apron was a spectre in our lives, a shadow of fear that hung over us all. The next thing I remember was I was on the ground, the life draining out of me. All I knew was the cold, hard reality of the cobblestones beneath me and the sharp pain in my throat. My last moments were filled with fear and confusion, a cruel end to a hard life. Little did I know I was walking the same path. As I left the police station, Instead of heading right, the shortest route to my lodging house, I turned left, heading towards Oldgate. That was the worst decision I could have made. As I walked, I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. The echo of my footsteps seemed to be accompanied by another set, a shadowy presence that was always a few steps behind. I quickened my pace, my heart pounding in my chest. The streets that I had walked countless times before now felt like a labyrinth, each turn leading me further into the unknown. The fear on the streets was palpable. Every man was a potential leather apron, every shadow a potential threat. Then, I stopped briefly and took a breather. It was short-lived. Then every hair on my body stood on end. A terror and fear like nothing I had ever known consumed me. A hatred, an evil, a presence, an aura was everywhere. In that moment, I was more than just a solitary figure. I was a lone woman standing on the precipice of oblivion, facing an embodiment of pure evil. The fear that swallowed me was so profound, so all-encompassing, 
that it seemed to echo through the silent streets of Whitechapel. A solitary tear traced a cold path down my cheek, a poignant reminder of the life I had led and the loves I had known. My life had been a tragic tapestry of abuse and beatings, a life devoid of the tender touch of true love. But in those final moments, it was the love for my children, the purest love I had ever known, that I clung to, even as the darkness closed in. Alone and terrified in my moment of absolute need, there was no hero coming to save me, no knight in shining armor to vanquish the demon before me. Instead, I was met with a monster, a grotesque embodiment of all the hardship and pain I'd ever known. By 1.44 a.m., my life was brutally ended in Mitre Square. That bastard took away my last moments. I never made it back to John, never borrowed that money from our daughter. I never had a chance to say goodbye to my loved ones. My life, filled with hardship and struggle, ended in a way no one should experience. Now let's consider the case of Catherine Eddowes, as it provides significant insight into the nature of Jack the Ripper. A police patrol occurred every 15 minutes, so all of the following actions took place within that time frame. This murder alone provides a solid, fact-based profile of the killer. The killer was able to convince his victims to accompany him to secluded areas, despite the ongoing panic and fear caused by the murders. This suggests a level of charm or persuasive ability, indicating a person who was socially adept and capable of manipulating others to achieve his ends. The killer would have had to possess significant physical strength. The act of strangulation, followed by mutilation and organ extraction, requires a considerable amount of force. This, combined with the fact that these acts were carried out swiftly and under the cover of darkness, suggests a person of robust constitution and stamina. Moreover, the killer demonstrated an exceptional level of control over his physiological responses, suggesting a high level of intelligence. The act of murder, particularly in such a gruesome manner, would typically trigger a strong fear or stress response in most individuals. However, Jack the Ripper seemed to exhibit an unnatural ability to suppress or control these responses, allowing him to carry out his horrific acts with a chilling level of calm and precision. In a poorly lit corner of the square, he subdued Edoise, cut her throat, raised her clothes, and made a significant incision from her groin to her chest. Despite the challenging circumstances, inadequate lighting and the body positioned on the ground, he managed to locate and extract her uterus and left kidney. This operation is difficult even under ideal conditions with a cadaver positioned on a waist-high dissection table and ample lighting, especially considering the kidney's deep location within abdominal fat and beneath other organs. The killer's ability to dismember and extract organs from a body on the ground, in the dark, and within a short time frame suggests a level of anatomical knowledge and surgical skill that would be challenging even for a trained medical student. The post-mortem records indicate that Catherine's face was severely disfigured, her throat was cut, and her abdomen was exposed with intestines drawn out to a large extent and placed over the right shoulder. A piece of the intestines about two feet was quite detached from the body and placed between the body and the left arm, apparently by design. The left kidney had been carefully removed and taken away. The act of removing the kidney suggested that the perpetrator had considerable knowledge of the position of the organs in the abdominal cavity and the way of removing them. The parts removed would be of no use for any professional purpose, indicating a possible thrill-seeking nature of the killer. Weapon of choice. The use of a notably sharp weapon suggests that the killer preferred close contact with his victims, which is often associated with a personal intense anger or rage. This wasn't merely driven by a desire to kill. Edows, his second victim of the night, is a testament to this fact. His intentions extended beyond murder. He sought to humiliate his victims. He desecrated their bodies, not just as an act of violence, but as a statement. His aim was to horrify the public and those who would inevitably stumble upon the bodies strewn across the streets. He wanted his crimes to be distinctive, to stand out amidst the ordinary atrocities. The type of killer who would commit such acts is typically classified as a lust killer or hedonistic killer, a subtype of serial killer. 
These individuals derive pleasure from the process of killing and often engage in acts of mutilation or desecration, as was the case with Jack the Ripper. They also seek to instill fear or horror in the public as part of a desire for power or control. It's important to note that Eddowes was his second kill of the night. Earlier, Elizabeth Stride's body was discovered in Dutfield's yard off Burner Street in Whitechapel at approximately 1 a.m. on September 30th, 1888. Her throat had been cut, but there were no other mutilations to her body. This suggests that the first murder did not satisfy the killer's hunger for violence. It's suspected that he may have been disturbed during the act, hence the lack of mutilations on Stride's body. The killer's path between the two murders took him from Dutfield's yard to Mitre Square, a distance of approximately one mile through the labyrinthine streets of London. A brisk walk would typically cover this distance in about 20 minutes. Consider the timeline. Elizabeth Stride's life was brutally ended at 1 a.m. and within the span of 45 minutes, the killer had traversed a mile to Mitre Square, committed another murder, and mutilated Catherine Eddowes. While extracting the organs, Jack's hands would have been drenched in blood and coated with body tissue. In fact, surgeons of that era typically performed surgeries with their bare hands, a revolting concept by today's standards, but a common practice at the time. This audacious act underscores the killer's daring and risk-taking nature. He was willing to navigate the city streets, covered in blood with body parts, risking detection. Although it also suggests he knows the streets and the scheduled patrols very well, allowing him to evade capture. Hence, he could live locally or works in the area. Beyond this horrific murder, Jack the Ripper also managed to remove two rings from Catherine. The coroner, Wynne Edwin Baxter, put forth a theory that this act could have been a calculated deception by the Ripper, intended to mislead the police and the public into believing that the motive for the murders was robbery. Alternatively, the removal of the rings could have been perceived as a trophy collection, a chilling testament to his kills. Now, we will examine the most important eyewitness accounts of Jack the Ripper, and AI will generate images based on these accounts. Please note that eyewitness testimony, while valuable, is not always reliable, especially in high-stress situations or when visibility is poor. These factors were certainly at play in the case of the Jack the Ripper murders. Israel Schwartz's account is particularly intriguing. He reported seeing a man attacking a woman, believed to be Elizabeth Stride, at around 12.45 a.m. on September 30, 1888. Stride's body was discovered at approximately 1 a.m. in Duckfield's yard off Burner Street in Whitechapel. This suggests a murder window of just 15 minutes. Schwartz described the man as being about 5 feet, 5 inches tall, aged around 30 with dark hair, a fair complexion, and a small brown moustache. He had a full face, broad shoulders, and appeared to be slightly intoxicated. Schwartz also reported the presence of a second man, who began to follow him after the first man shouted, Lipsky. This second man was taller, around 5 feet 11 inches, and had a fresh complexion and light brown hair. The presence of this second man raises questions. Was he an accomplice or simply a passerby? Police records suggest that they traced and eliminated this second man as a suspect, but the reasons for this are unclear. Indeed, in a report dated the 19th of October, 1888, Chief Inspector Swanson wrote that the police apparently do not suspect the second man, although we do not know why this should have been the case. Why did the police not reveal the identity of the second man? And why didn't Chief Inspector Swanson pursue these doubts further? Another key witness was Joseph Lewende, who saw a man and woman talking quietly together near the location where another victim, Catherine Eddowes, was found. Lewende's description of the man matches some aspects of Schwartz's account, but again, the reliability of this testimony is uncertain due to the poor lighting conditions and the brief nature of the encounter. Lawenda stated the man had the appearance of a sailor and was aged about 30. He was around 5 feet 9 inches tall of medium build. He had a fair complexion and a small fair moustache. He sported a reddish neckerchief tied in a knot, wore a pepper and salt coloured loose-fitting jacket and had on a grey peaked cloth cap. 
The tight timeline of these murders is indeed perplexing. Could the Ripper have inflicted such brutal injuries and escaped undetected in such a short window of time? It seems unlikely, but without more concrete evidence we can only speculate. In conclusion, while these eyewitness accounts provide some insight into the possible appearance and behavior of Jack the Ripper, they also raise more questions than they answer. The identity of the second man, the reliability of the witnesses, and the feasibility of the timeline all remain points of contention in this enduring mystery. Now it's time for us to profile the killer. White male. This aligns with the majority of theories and eyewitness accounts. Aged between 28, 40 years. This is a reasonable age range given the physical requirements of the crimes. Slim to well-built physique. This is consistent with eyewitness accounts and the physical demands of the crimes. Had a moustache, based on eyewitness accounts. Eyewitness accounts can be unreliable, but this detail is often mentioned. Classified as a lust killer or hedonistic killer. Given the sexual nature of the crimes, this classification is fitting. Socially manipulative individual with good social skills and persuasion. This could explain how he was able to lure his victims. Physically strong with high stamina, necessary for the physical demands of the crimes. Highly controlled, with no empathy, consistent with the brutal nature of the crimes. Possessed anatomical knowledge and surgical skill. Possibly a surgeon, medical student or someone with similar experience. Thrill-seeking nature and desire for attention. This could explain the public nature of the crimes and the taunting letters sent to the police. Likely lived alone and was not accountable to anyone. This could explain how he was able to commit the crimes without arousing suspicion. The canonical five murders were all within a mile of each other. This suggests he was familiar with the area and likely lived or worked in Whitechapel. Desired power, control and dominance. This is consistent with the brutal and controlling nature of the crimes. Weapon of choice. The use of a notably sharp weapon suggests that the killer preferred close contact with his victims which is often associated with a personal, intense anger or rage. Sexually inadequate, hated, feared and was intimidated by women. This is speculative but could be a possible motive for the crimes. Thank you for watching. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic, so please leave a comment below. Join our community of curious minds and future explorers by subscribing, liking, and sharing our videos. Together, we'll uncover the hidden gems of the universe and beyond. Until next time, fellow explorers, remember that there's always more to discover in the quantum beyond.